Our first scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. The ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Whenever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Our second reading today, Mary Kay just read to us, is from Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These are the words of God for the people of God. In my years of ministry, I did a, a, a lot of premarital counseling, and I also did a lot of uh, marital counseling. And one of the things that I talked to the couples about was a thing called a language of love. And what I mean by that is this is that every one of us has a language of love. Um, but it's different for all of us. And what happens in marriage is and among young couples is this, is that what I think uh, makes me feel love is what my wife um, feels loved with. And so uh, that's where the conflict comes in. And couples have a hard time figuring out what it is the language of love for each other. And I say to them this, have you ever asked them? Stop trying to figure it out. Why don't you ask them what their language, what is it that makes you feel loved? And so I've asked my wife, what is it that makes you feel loved? And her answer was this, spending time together, especially around the table. That's when I feel most loved for you. And so some uh, men think, you know, my wife uh, feels loved when I give her gifts. And uh, so then he gives gifts, and she's not real happy with the gifts. Why? Because he's got to work a lot of hours to be able to provide the gifts for her. And what she really wanted is she just wanted time together with them. And so that's the way it goes back and forth. And so um, today's passage that we read about with David is this. It reminds me of the fact of these languages of love. And what David wanted was what he thought would show his love to God. And he thought that God wanted him to build a temple. You see what is happening right now is that uh, David in the kingdom, everything's going smoothly. He's had a horrible, horrible uh, many decades, but now things are finally quieted down. And so he's sitting there thinking... You know, God, I love you so much. I just wonder, what is it that you really want from me? And so David came to the conclusion that what God wanted for him was to build a temple in order to put, um, you know, the holy things inside of that temple and to make it a beautiful temple. And God then speaks through the prophet to David and he said, when did I ever ask you to build something for me? In other words, that was not God's love language. He said, I never asked you to build the temple for me. What makes you think that this is what I want 
so that you uh, could say that you love me. Because it's not. I want you to know that, David. But if we would have read along in the passage, it says this. God then speaks to David and he says, David, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how much I love you instead of you showing me how much you love me. And what I'm going to do, David, is I'm going to secure your throne. And your, your throne, David, is going to be lifted up among all other thrones. And so here is a prophetic message about the fact that Jesus will one day come and that his eternal uh, throne would be set up through the Davidic line. And so that's why in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the, the, what we read is this, the word of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at that question of what does God want? Have you ever asked God that? God, what do you want? Well, David thought that what God wanted was he wanted him to build a temple. But you see, Jesus tells us what God wants, and certainly the Old Testament tells us what God wants, but we don't listen and we don't do what God wants. And so Jesus said there in Matthew 22, the scripture lesson that we read this morning, which is this. Jesus said, I want you to do this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all yourself. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And so there were 613 laws in the Old Testament. And so uh, God says that will sum it up from there. And so we are told that we are to love God. Now, this is the way we work, right? All I know I'm supposed to love God. Here's the question, how am I supposed to love God? Okay, well, you know what? The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament and it tells us in the New Testament. The way we are to love God can be summed up in one word. Church, here's the word, it's obedience. That's how we show our love towards God. And so in John 14, 15, the Bible says this, if you, Jesus said it, if you love me, you will what? You will obey my commandments. So there is Jesus' love language. You want to show me you love me? Then here are the commandments of God written in the word of God, and I want you to obey them. And as you do that, you're speaking a language of love to me and the Father. And then he says this, we are supposed to love others. Well, then we ask ourselves this question. Well, how are we supposed to love others? Well, the Bible tells us how we're supposed to do that too. We're supposed to simply love them as what we call the golden rule. And so in Luke chapter 6, verse 31, it says this. Do unto others as what? You would have them do unto you. Would you agree that we probably all in here would like justice in our lives? Well, then give justice to other people. Would you agree that we want mercy in our lives? Well, then give mercy to other people. Don't you want forgiveness in your life? Well, then give forgiveness to other people. Now, what I want to do this morning and the rest of the time that I have is I want to step back. And I want us to kind of imagine, here we are, we're in a coffee shop. And we're just having conversation. And we're talking about what do you think, what do you think God wants from us? And what we're going to see here is this. We're going to look at six things that God doesn't want from us. Okay, but we think that he wants them from us. And as I go through these things, um, I want you to know this. There's nothing wrong with any six of these things, but it's not what God wants most from us, not any of these. But we have come to the conclusion that this is what God wants from us. So let's look at those six things. And so if we begin to do these things, here's what happens with these six things. We begin to think this. This will cover up my disobedience to God. This will also cover up my disobedience to my neighbor and not loving them like I should. So I want you to look at these six. And what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself this. Have I had those thoughts that I thought this is what God really wanted from us? And maybe uh, God will be speaking to you about one of those six and saying, well, what are you going to do about it? 
The first thing that uh, many people in the church think is what God wanted from us is he wants fancy buildings. That's what he wants. And isn't that exactly what David wanted to do? David wanted to build a fancy building for God. And God said to him, David, I never ask you to build one of those. David, the first thing that I want from you is I want obedience. You want to build me a beautiful building, but David, we've got a problem here. You see, the problem is this. You have not been obedient to me. Because in the word of God, it says that if, if you were to become a king, you were to be a, a husband of one wife. And David, you already have eight of them. And the last one that you got was not uh, something that I was particularly happy about with Bathsheba. And so you've been disobeying me. And you can walk through the whole books of First and Second Samuel and you can see that David was a, a servant of God who disobeyed him often. And David had to pay a price for those things. And so God's speaking to him and saying, I didn't want that, David. What I wanted from you was disobedience. And you know what? You had a hard time being obedient to me. And then he says this, I also wanted you to have mercy and to love others. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to travel to Europe. Uh, Judy and I have had the opportunity to do that. So when we left here, um, our son Matthew... Uh, he joined the Air Force, and uh, he was stationed in England for uh, five years, and uh, he fell in love with a woman over there, and uh, I went over there and I married them. And I figured, you know what, as long as we're here, we'll do some sightseeing. And we went into London, and here's what we did. We went in and we saw a number of these large cathedrals that are there. And Europe is filled with a lot of beautiful cathedrals. And what has happened to them today is this. We went on a Sunday. And we found the church meeting off to the side in one of those uh, beautiful buildings. And there was usually around 10 or 12 of them that were there. And what God wanted for them was this, was wanted obedience from them. But now what they have become is they have become destinations for, for people to just come and look at the beauty and take pictures if you're allowed to take pictures uh, there. And so God has been saying to Europe, the people of Europe, all I ever wanted was this. I wanted your obedience. That's what I wanted. But you were not obedient to me. Instead, you built these beautiful buildings, and now they're empty. And what people come to do is they come to look at the architecture. I'm not pleased with that. And I don't know if you know this, but in Europe, only 5% of the people in Europe go to church. Only 5%. That doesn't mean they're Christians, but it means they at least go to church. And God says, I wasn't looking for that. God says to the people of Europe, I wasn't looking for a beautiful building. What I wanted was I wanted you in those buildings to build a legacy of obedience to me and love towards others. That's what I wanted. And if you would have done that, you wouldn't have been able to seat enough people in here and Europe would be completely different. But they disobeyed God. Here's the second thing that people think that God wants from us. He wants our religious traditions. We, we tend to think that God's very pleased uh, with our traditions and that they're very important to God. You see, when and, and I've learned this, is that when a pastor comes into a new congregation and then begins to change you know, the bulletin just a little bit, you find out uh, there's going to be somebody who says, Pastor, don't mess with that. And so they say, put back whatever you took out of that and I, I, or else I'm going to leave. And I said to them, well, then go ahead and leave because I'm not putting it back in. You see, because it's just simply tradition and the way that we do things on Sunday morning. There is no place in the scriptures that you can look and see, oh, yeah, we start a service with a prelude. And then we go into some, uh, you know, some maybe a song or two, and then we just go through those. There's no place in the Bible that it says that. And so we have religious traditions today. Now, 
What happens with these religious traditions is we think that they honor God, but they don't. Many do not then have even biblical support. Let me give you an example. When I was your pastor 28 years ago, usually there wasn't a man in this congregation who didn't have a suit and a tie on. That was the tradition of this church. And the women would have at least a skirt or a dress on. That was the tradition of the church. And if somebody came in in blue jeans and a t-shirt, it was frowned upon because that's not our tradition. And so we dressed up for God on Sunday. But what happened on Monday, and sun, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, is that a lot of people lived like hell out there in the community. And God said, I don't care how you dress. What I care is this. Are you going to obey me on Monday through Saturday and keep my word in front of other people? That's what I care about the most. And are you loving others? You see, Jesus asked why his disciple. Uh, what happened was Jesus was going, uh, he, was, he was invited to a dinner, and usually they washed their hands before this, and they didn't offer anything for him to, to wash. And so he sat down, and Jesus and his disciples ate foods, and the Pharisees came and said, we noticed that you didn't wash your hands. And Jesus had this to say to them. He says, you know what? You folks, you worship me in vain. This is Mark 7, verses 7 through 9. Your teachings are but rules that have been taught by man. You have let go of the commands of God and you're holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your traditions. Now hear me, hear me please. Are, are you listening? I am not against tradition. I'm not against tradition. But hear me carefully. Traditions are great as long as I don't force them on somebody else. They're great as long as I don't force them on other people. And then we, and we do that. We cancel out the love that God wants us to have for others. So make sure that if you have traditions, that's wonderful, but don't force them on other people. And tell them, if you're going to be close to God, you need to do these traditions. Because you'll cancel out the love that God wants you to have for him. Here's the third one. Extra biblical rules, or it's also called legalism. Now, legalism is an extra biblical rule that, it, it, that we put on people and we say this. If you really want to honor God, if you really want to honor God, then do this. And so they always have what seems like a Bible verse that says, you know what, you should do this. And if you do that, you know what, God will give you extra credit. Well, do you know that the doctrine of the United Methodist Church is there's no such thing as extra credit before God? It's called works of supererogation. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but it's in your discipline. We don't believe that there's any such thing as extra credit with God. And so what happens is we think we can do extra credit for God in order to cover up the fact that we're not obeying God and that we're not loving others. And so what they do is they'll tell you, well, look at what this verse says, but what they've really done is they've taken the, the text out of, uh, the, the verse out of context. And so uh, l let me give you an example of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Paul writes this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, the context of that message, if you'll open it up and you look at your Bible and you'll read it, see the context, is Paul's talking about sexual immorality. That's what he's talking about here. But then there were some people in our age who came along and says, if you really want to honor God, Frank, you know you should be eating organic food. 
Because that, now you're really taking care of your body. And Frank, you really need to be exercising at least four times a week. You need to do those things. And if you'll do those things, you know what? God will be real happy with you. And I found out, well, that's not true. You see, because I do exercise four times a week, and look at me today. It doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot of good. I'm just trying to keep up the strength that I have. And so I am saying this, is you shouldn't think that some rules are actually extra credit with God. Now, you can have some rules that are extra credit, or whatever you want to call them, but they're only rules for my life and not for yours. I have no right to put extra credit rules on somebody else's life. Let me, let me tell you this. You see, when God gave you the Ten Commandments, what did he do? He built a fence around it and he said, don't go beyond that fence because you have sinned against me if you do. And here's what the Pharisees did. They came along and they said, well, we're worried about you going over the fence, so we're going to build another fence. And it's going to be inside of that fence, and so don't you go over that fence. Now, why would they build a fence inside of another fence? Of, because of their weakness. And that's why we build fences inside of God's fences. It's not because of strength. It's because of weakness. And when we build that fence, and then we cross our own fence, it does not mean that we have sinned against God. We're just simply admitting that we have weaknesses in certain area. And so I do have my own fences. One of those is in the area of alcohol. Okay, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't drink alcohol. You know that. And so, um, but because I was an alcoholic at one time when I was young, God said, set up a fence and don't go over that. You can't even drink it. I don't want you even near it, Frank, okay? One of that has to do with because of the fact that you're a pastor and some people look at pastors and say, hmm, he shouldn't be doing that. But, and so I've made a choice not to do it. And so it's all about weaknesses. And I've had a weakness. Now it's been 48 years since I've taken a drink of alcohol. Why? Because that's my weakness. I'm afraid if I ever take up a drink again, I'll never put it down again. Here's the fourth thing. It's emotional zeal or passion. Now, there's nothing wrong with passion. And there's nothing wrong with emotional zeal. You see, because in our lives, there will be times where we'll be very passionate about our worship with God, and then there will be other times when we're not. Where God took me since I left, left here over the 28 years, I have worshipped in many other different denominations. And some of them were very passionate about their worship. And so when I got into their worship services, I noticed that when they started singing, they started doing this. They just started raising their hands like this. And if they were really spiritual, you know what they did. You know, they put up both hands like this. And if they were really, really spiritual, they got out in the middle of, of the aisle and they started dancing and they started doing that. And I'm sitting there and I got my hands in my pocket like, uh, nope, ain't going to do that. All right. Um, it's not that I don't have emotional zeal for God because I do. You see, but when many of us hear the word love, what we think about is we think about emotions. And so when the Bible says, love the Lord your God, we're thinking about, well, I need to love him emotionally. That is not what it means. The word love here is this. Uh, it's, it says that the heart is the seat of emotions, but it's not, many people think. It's the seat of the will. And so in Jesus' day, the heart was the seat of the will. Now, it's changed in our culture today. And so God calls us to love him with the seat of our will. And so the Pharisees were a group of people who were filled with passion for all 613 laws of God. But here's the problem. They were passionate about those, but they didn't have compassion on other people. And it turned them away. 
you see the greatest act of love that has ever been demonstrated in the history of mankind is when Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. But if you read the context, if you read what happened before he went to the cross, you know what happened. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane and there he prayed. And we don't see anything about Jesus raising his hand to God and saying, Oh God, thank you so much. I get to die for all of humanity. I just worship you. We don't get that. You see, he went into that garden and it says that he sweat as drops of blood. And he said to God, is there any way? Is there any way that you can remove this from me? And God said no. Well, then he comes back a second time and he asks the same thing. And then he comes back a third time. And what does Jesus say? Well, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, it was all about the will. The fifth thing, then, is biblical knowledge. Some of us think that what God is asking and what he wants most from us is biblical knowledge. He wants us to be biblical scholars. And I'm not saying that that's not important. But I'm saying this, it's important because we need to understand a few things. We need to understand some of the stories of the Bible and we need to understand what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And that's where the Bible comes in. We need to know what is obedience to God and what is disobedience to God. And so deep biblical knowledge without obedience and love to others, Jesus would say this and Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13, it's worthless. It's absolutely worthless. Bible knowledge can easily be a source of pride. And so the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8.1, knowledge puffs up, but love does what? It builds up. You see, and if, it's, if I'm reading my Bible on a daily basis, and I'm studying it and I'm doing those things, but it doesn't make me more obedient to God, and it doesn't, make me a more loving person, then you know what? It's all for nothing. The last thing that some of us think that God wants from us is that he wants us in the church to isolate. To isolate from our community and from those who are not Christians. Separate ourselves from that. And today there is a lot of hostility towards Christians, much more so in previous years. And then COVID came along, and for two years, a number of people stayed at home because they were concerned about getting COVID and what would happen with that. And so for two years, many Christians isolated themselves from the body of Christ. But then when the church began to open back up and many people started returning, what happened was this, is that they had changed their lifestyle so much that they didn't go back to church. And so during COVID, we know this, is that the attendance in church afterwards fell 40%. And if that's not bad enough, 40% of the leaders said, I don't want to lead anymore. And so the church, as it came back, was a crippled church. But not only that, our community was crippled. You see, because while the people in the church were hanging out at home, there were other people who were trying to push their agenda at school boards, in the communities, in the states, and that in some of the agenda that they were pushing was something we thought would never happen. I was a pastor in Ligonier before I came here, and if you ever have been there, uh, and if you haven't, you need to go there. It's the most beautiful town you'll ever uh, see. And uh, we, don't, we don't have youth groups in our churches. We put all of our youth together for the whole community, and we hire a full-time youth pastor uh, to do that. And so when the ministerial would meet, the, the full-time youth pastor would come and so we ask him, what's going on in the schools? And he says, let me tell you some of the things that are going on. 
we've had a couple of teachers who've been fired because they called a girl a she or a her. And we're not allowed to do that anymore. Or they called a guy a him. And they were fired because they're not allowed to do that anymore. And he went on and told us many other things that were happening. And many of the pastor's mouths just dropped over and said, this is happening in Little Ligonier. You bet it is. Why? Because we nestled down in our homes and we didn't go to the, to the school board meetings. And elections came and went. And now their agenda was in the school. And what God wanted was this. He didn't want us to isolate during that time, dear ones. He wanted us to infiltrate. He wanted us to infiltrate the schools. He wanted us to infiltrate the town councils. He wanted us to infiltrate those so that people would then get an understanding by looking at them is what it means to have moral people in leadership positions within our communities and beyond. You see, as Christians, we need to have contact if we're going to have impact. And so I leave you with this this morning. Do you want to give God what he really wants this morning? Then give him your obedience. Read his word and ask yourself as you read a chapter, however much, is there something here I'm disobeying? And if so, am I willing to change today when it comes to that? Are you loving other people like you want to be loved. You see, that's what God wants most from you. And if you say, you know what, I've been hung up on one of those six things and I want you to star it. And I want you to just go to praying this week and asking God, what can you do to change that in my life so I'm no longer going to be hung up there? Let's pray together. And so, Father, we thank you for your love for us. And God, you call us to not only love you, but to love others. And so this morning, God, through your Holy Spirit, we pray that you have spoken to our hearts and that we will take what we have learned here. And where we're not being obedient, Lord, help us to become more obedient. And Father, for this, we'll give you thanks and praise. And may you receive all the glory through our obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.